Good afternoon, everybody. I'll ask the, the usual questions that we ask in this kind of session. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me as well as um, uh, see the slides. So um, it's indeed a pleasure for me to be, uh, be the last speaker uh, today because uh, um, as you have seen, uh, the alumni of the Human Genetics Unit have uh, taken you through the entire length and breadth of uh, genetics and genomics. Uh, and they have also covered the entire length and breadth of the country from Jaffna to, um, uh, to Gaul. So it need a uh, pleasure uh, for me to be the last speaker. I will uh, talk to you briefly on uh, pharmacogenomics. Well, the idea of this presentation is to briefly introduce you to a basic understanding of pharmacogenomics and its clinical application. And um, in the talks that you had this morning, you have already got a flavor of that. The word pharma, words pharmacogenetics and genomics have had various definitions, and uh, these are two of them. But today, they are used interchangeably. And of course, uh, the word pharmacogenomics is, um, you know, uh, is, is more fashionable than pharmacogenetics. Um, there are two clinical applications of using genetic and genomic information uh, in uh, clinical medicine. Uh, for the first one is, of course, uh, pharmacogenomic testing to predict drug response not only predict the response, whether it would be um, accurate or not, but also to predict uh, the various adverse reactions that uh, you may de uh, develop. Secondly, uh, of course, is tumor profiling uh, and identifying uh, genetic mutations in tumors so that uh, you can predict whether a certain uh, therapy will work or not, and thereby ensuring that um, the best treatment is given to patients, uh, which is, uh, this is uh, what is practiced in the field of oncology. So when we talk about pharmacogenomic testing to predict drug response, as you know, when we take uh, any medicine, when we take any medicine, there are four possible outcomes. The first one, uh, is that there will be, um, the drug will not be tex, um, you know, toxic to the individual, but it would have no benefit. That is the first outcome. The second one is the drug is te uh, te toxic, to the, uh, toxic to the individual, but it is beneficial. The, second, uh, the third one is the drug is to uh, toxic to the individual, and not beneficial. And the final one is what we would like to always have, that is the drug is not toxic to the individual, um, but it is beneficial. So this understanding has been with us for a long time. And in the late 1990s, a paper in JAMA highlighted the severe toxic effects that drugs have on patients. And uh, they also highlighted the fact that in the US, for example, nearly 100,000 people die of adverse drug reactions every year. And more than 2 million people suffer from uh, the various um, adverse reactions, which does not result in death, but of course, chronic issues. Now this realization led to um, people really uh, taking uh, an initiative uh, in uh, around the turn of the century as it were, in an initiative called the, the SIP, SNP consortium. Now as you know, the single nucleotide polymorphisms are the commonest genetic variants that we found, find in our genome. 
and these genome, uh, these variants uh, predict uh, the metabolism, uh, excretion, and uh, you know development of axial reactions and so on of, of uh, when you take a drug. So therefore, um, uh, there was this SNP consortium formed, and if you look at this website, this is a screen grab I took uh, somewhere in uh, maybe um, you know to the year 2000. So I've had this screen grab for the past 20 years. You won't find this anymore on the web. Um, all the major pharmaceutical companies in the world and uh, the major uh, um, major biomedical uh, funder, Wellcome Trust, came together. Uh, to look and identify and catalog all the single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is what this is the initiative which led to the cataloging of all the genetic variants in the genome uh, at the turn of this century. And uh, this um, initiative um, led to further work, which resulted in the identification of genetic variants which contribute to metabolism excretion, adverse um, reactions, and so on. And uh, this data eventually got into clinical practice. And the first, uh, you know, FDA approved guidelines which came, came around the year 2008, where um, using genomic information uh, to predict the uh, dosing uh, of warfarin was one of the first recommendations that came into clinical practice. And um, Tools such as what I have shown here, uh, warfarindosing.org, uh, were developed around that time to help uh, the doctors do genotyping and use that genetic information together with the clinical information to predict the proper dosing of warfarin. Why was this taken as one of the first initiatives? Uh, it was one of the first um, initiatives because one in 10 emergency room admissions in the Western world is because of um, wrong warfarin dosing and resulting in patients having various bleeding manifestations. This was the reason why warfarin was one of the first ones which were, of course, looked at. But today, if you go to FDA's website and uh, Google FDA table of pharmacogenomic biomarkers in drug labeling, you will see a whole heap of you know, genetic recommendations that are now out there that we should be using in our clinical practice. But of course, those are not wide uh, used wide, uh, widespread. But if you look at this list and go and look at the drug labels of the drugs that you're prescribing to your patients, you will see that there's a lot of genetic information that you should actually be incorporating in your genetic day-to-day uh, -day clinical practice but um, around the world, not only in Sri Lanka, it is not really happening. So why is this information relevant and important for us? So a few years ago, we looked at our data and collaborated with an international group um, spanning uh, Singapore and uh, Europe and so on, uh, looking at the, um, uh, you know, our genetic variants and how they relate to the rest of the world. So the, I would like to show you the results of that, uh, that, uh, that work uh, to highlight to you the importance of incorporating our genetic information in our clinical practice. So these four boxes as they are, uh, are boxes which show genetic distance um, of individual people, uh, you know, in genetic distance in terms of uh, the similarity or the, and dissimilarities. The populations that are listed here in different colors are Sinhalese, Tamils, Moors, uh, GIH is Gujaratis in Houston, uh, Punjabis in Lahore, Bengalis, um, uh, Sri Lankan Tamil, STU, is Sri Lankan Tamils in um, UK, Indian Tamils in UK, Indians in Sing uh, Singapore, mainly Indian Tamils. Um, the CHS is Chinese, uh, Malays, and CEU is white Western European. So if you look at the first slide, uh, first, um, first box, those are the Sinhalese Tamils and the Boers. And we tend to the individuals that we studied tend to segregate together, tend to cluster together. So there is not much different between the Sinhalese, Tamil and Moor populations in terms of their genetic distance. 
Then when we put them together with the South Asian populations that I listed previously, we also cluster together, not much difference. Now, then when we take us and compare us with the Singaporeans, the Malays and the Chinese, immediately there is a distance. And then we take all the South Asian populations, the Sri Lankans, South Asians, Singaporeans, and then compare them with the white Western Europeans, you can see the genetic distances that exist. So why is this important? This is important because as you know, what do we do? We look at the British national formulary, which is um, prepared for the white Western European population look at the dosing, look at the adverse event profiles, and so on. And we, be, we, we, we expect our patients to respond in a similar fashion. And uh, that is not the case. And that is why there are lots of drug failures, there are lots of uh, non-compliance on part of the patients, and so on. And the list goes on, and I can talk about it a lot. But we got to now, uh, as we go on in the future, start incorporating genomic information in prescribing. Otherwise, we'll be left behind and we will not be doing the correct thing by our patients. So I hope that I've given you the glimpse of why we should be getting into pharmacogenomic testing and using that and incorporating that in our day-to-day uh, -day practice. Moving on to tumor profiling and targeted therapy. Now that is where we, you know, talk of all these fancy words like precision medicine and, uh, you know, uh, and so on. So when you take a group of patients with a cancer, um, as um, it was described in previous talks, all cancers are genetic. That is, a genetic abnormality had been triggered in the uh, drug rest, um, in, in, a, in a particular tissue. So... Some people have inherited genetic mutations, which kind of make that triggering process, the somatic mutation, faster. So while some cancers are inherited or you have a predisposition, uh, all cancers have an underlying genetic trigger, um, uh, underlying genetic change, uh, which could have been triggered by that inherited predisposition or uh, uh, could have been triggered by some environmental factor. So when you look at tumors you and you know profile them genetically, you find that, let's say in this group of patients, which we show here, all of them have breast cancer. The genetic mutations that you find in the tumors are not the same. Different people have different mutations. And based on that mutation profile, the drugs that may work for them will be different. So we need to incorporate this information in therapy to get the best outcome for the patients. This realization came uh, with the molecular pathology work which were happening on tumor uh, tissue. Here is the famous adenoma carcinoma sequence, which shows that the progression um, and the stage of disease uh, would depend on the acquisition of different mutations. So incorporating these into treatment protocols uh, is important. So how do you do that? You can uh, get tumor tissue, um, a pathological histological slide, and you do uh, what you call a laser capture microdissection and take out the uh, uh, you know, tumor tissue within that histological specimen, because as you know, in the tissue itself, there'll be normal tissue and, uh, and uh, the uh, malignant tissue and it's best to get the normal tissue and test. But in Sri Lanka, we don't have lecture capture microdissectors because they are very expensive machines, 200 million rupees per machine. So therefore, what we do is we extract DNA from the entire tumor, but our, um, the better thing to do is this, but uh, uh, you can still manage because the tumor will have um, cancerous tissue. And uh, so to give you an example of how we do that, so one of them is uh, KRAS testing. KRAS is um, um, mutations in the KRAS gene are highly specific neg negative predictors of response to single agent thyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors. 
and they are used in uh, colorectal prediction uh, response in colorectal cancer and uh, small lung cell cancers. Mm, so, um, what basically happen is, um, you know, if um, so, if you have um, uh, if the KRAS gene uh, is producing the usual KRAS protein. Uh, through the EGFR receptor, there'll be simulation and there'll be normal cell growth. Um, um, you can stop that cell growth by giving an uh, inhibitor of, the, uh, of EGFR or EGFR blocker, uh, provided the KRAS uh, gene is um, properly um, is normal. But if, we, if it has a mutation, there's no point giving the blocker because uh, the mutation makes that um, uh, the KRAS gene gives signals automatically. And as a result of that, uh, whether you give the drug or not, uh, the cell will just keep on, uh, the cells will just keep on dividing. Uh, so therefore you have to look at a uh, different, uh, um, uh, different therapy. Um, so the drug would be wasted and a course of treatment is about 2 million rupees. Um, so you will be wasting a drug. So you can take a tumor tissue, extract DNA and you can sequence, and uh, when we sequence, what happens is, uh, as I told you, we don't uh, we don't have laser capture microdesectors in Sri Lanka. We will sequence, and when we sequence, we have the normal uh, uh, sequence, uh, which is very prominent. But the little peaks uh, that you see, uh, the little peaks that you see, um, uh, will um, uh, will show you that there is a tumor uh, tissue there, and you can pick them up, um, uh, the mut mutated tissue uh, from there. And that way you make a diagnosis and, you know, with a, uh, well, about a 10,000 rupee test, uh, you uh, save uh, 2 million rupees worth of wasted drugs. So that's the trade-off that we have. We've been doing a KRAS testing for a long time. So if you are interested, you can read this up. Uh, but um, uh, you, there are lots of other things like EGFR mutation testing, BRAF mutations, and so on. Um, that are down in the country now. So um, all these tests are available and you can use. And my, this is my final slide. Um, so you can also, uh, uh, you may have he also heard of the uh, word liquid biopsy. Now that is because the tumor cells actually get into the uh, blood and are um, in circulation and the DNA is in circulation. So if you cannot get to the tumor tissue, you can of course um, uh, get the uh, blood and uh, through uh, use the high throughput uh, next generation sequencing and so on where uh, even um, minute particles of these could be sequenced and identified. So that is something for the future. Um, uh, we are already practicing these in a small way in Sri Lanka, but uh, these will become standard um, uh, ways of identifying malignant uh, tissue and profiling them uh, as we go on. So. Um, that's it uh, from me. Um, so I hope you got a flavor from uh, the uh, about the application of uh, uh, genetics and genomics um, to uh, direct um, you know therapies, and um, hopefully uh, these will uh, get incorporated more and more into our practice, and we will all of us uh, who are here using them um, in uh, the future. Thank you very much. So the chair tells me to move on to the next um, next presentation, which will be on uh, the, we'll take everybody through um, some case scenarios. And uh, also, um, I think uh, the chair also wants you to uh, send any questions while chat. So Prof will be uh, discussing a few cases, uh, case scenarios. And uh, that will focus mainly on implementing genomic medicine in the uh, clinical settings. So a few examples will be discussed. So I will request uh, Nirmala to look out at the, uh, on the chat box for any questions um, and um, uh, direct them. Um, all right then. So, um, you know, even now the bread and butter of uh, uh, genetic, um, uh, genetics and genomic practice is uh, the um, chromosomal abnormalities that you would uh, find on a day-to-day -day basis. So here is the um, karyotype um, of a child with a dysmorphic uh, features and development delay. And uh, any guesses on what the chromosomal abnormality is? 
you can un unmute yourself if you want to and uh, give some answers. Uh, yeah. Everyone has been listening to us uh, from here. Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, talk. Prof, I think some are responding through the chat. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if you, um, um, if you um, uh, saw the extra chromosome, um, extra chromosome 21, yes. yeah, yeah, of um, down syndrome. Uh, so this is a case of down syndrome that is by far the commonest, um, you know, chromosomal abnormality that we always see, um, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, and even in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So I've said based on your interpretation of the um, Caritap results, discuss what information you would provide the parents regarding the natural history and prognosis of the condition. So obviously, um, we will, um, you know, uh, give them the diagnosis and then uh, following that uh, discuss about uh, the um, the motor speech as well as uh, cognitive uh, developmental issues that will come up and then uh, give them um, um, uh, you know give them uh, uh, or tell them about what kind of expectation that you can have the, uh, with this child in the long run and then of course direct them uh, to appropriate um, uh, th therapy. Um, I think, um, I mean, from the, uh, from the point of view of uh, the clinical geneticists, uh, uh, from us, what we uh, generally find is the fact that we need to um, kind of emphasize to them that uh, they are, the pediatricians are doing the correct thing because uh, they always want reassurance from us as to whether they are, you know, the correct thing is uh, being done uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, child, and uh, so in uh, most of the time, our practice tends to be um, uh, reassuring them. Yes, the correct thing is um, uh, being done, and of course, uh, directing them to resources in the uh, hospitals as well as uh, uh, also the in the community because. Um, uh, there are uh, several community groups which have, uh, you know, which are doing excellent work. Always for the family to find another person who is, uh, um, uh, you know, another family which has a child with the same problem is uh, useful. Um, so we direct them to those, um, you know, community services as well, especially to do lab foundation, which does a lot of work. Let's move on to another one. Um, a couple with subfertility is karyotype. The husband is found to have the karyotype below. What's the abnormality? So if um, some, um, it's anyway, there's an arrow there. It's, um, as you can see, one chromos uh, chromosome 21 uh, is missing and that's translocated onto chromosome, uh, chromosome 14. So this is a balanced translocation carrier, uh, father who, came to light because of, I guess, the previous child who um, we, um, uh, uh, not the previous child, um, I mean, another, a previous, uh, not the one we showed, but another child uh, who would have had a balanced translocation, uh, sorry, uh, unbalanced translocation, meaning that uh, they would have had this chromosome 14 and two, uh, and this from the father and another one from the mother. So it will be trisomy 21. Um, and uh, then, uh, so that kind of diagnosis results in karyotyping of the parents. And then we will, um, in some instances, detect a um, person who is a balanced translocation carrier, like this instance. Based on your interpretation of the karyotype, I'll discuss what information you would provide this couple regarding their reproductive options. Obviously, um, you know, uh, so the recurrence risk um, generally uh, is um, uh, varies. Um, so, with the, uh, when a father is a carrier of um, the um, 14, uh, 14, 21 translocation risk ranges from about three to 5%. If, if, if it's a mother, the risk is higher. Obviously the reason is um, uh, the size of the sperm and the ovum. The uh, sperm is a you know small structure. So getting a translocated chromosome packed into that is difficult. Uh, 
whereas uh, uh, it easily gets into a more viable ovum. Um, and then, of course, you can uh, give the reproductive risks based on that. But um, the other thing to talk about um, or for general, I mean, why should we be karyotyping any Down syndrome baby at all? Uh, can't we just give a clinical diagnosis and wait? Because this is a, um, this particular karyotype is an illustration of why we should be doing it. Uh, because this family, if because they are having carrying a balanced translocation now, is this couple is at increased risk of having a baby. Then, of course, um, uh, with uh, a second baby with Down syndrome, and then of course. Um, um, if it was a 2121 translocation, that is 100%, uh, you know, risk. So um, we we need to uh, make sure that we are not missing a 2121 translocation. The um, so what are the reproductive options here? So if you um, remember the talk that um, uh, Dr. Padinia gave a little while ago, uh, you can I think you can that. You could take that as a reference point. So either if they're going for their own, uh, um, uh, you know, having a baby naturally, then of course you've got to tell them the risks and, uh, um, uh, you know, suggest uh, some form of prenatal diagnosis. But then uh, given the fact that termination is not permitted in our country, uh, you might want to suggest to them that they might want to consider IVF and then uh, uh, doing PGD and uh, tra uh, transferring uh, normal embryos so that they would have a normal child and not have, uh, you know, the issues related to termination of pregnancy um, and so on. So those are the matters we discuss. And then, of course, in this case, if, you know, you can't afford it, uh, you can go for donor sperms and um, uh, do IUI and try to have a baby that way. Um, and of course, um, well, uh, all failing adoption is also an option. So therefore, uh, there are, we, will, we will need to discuss all those reproductive issues. Okay, here's another one. So um, again, uh, 25, uh, 21, uh, 25 year old female who has child with Down syndrome, found her karyotype shown. Here, so the karyotype shown here is the 2121 translocation. So, this person will only have, uh, can only have a child with Down syndrome. Um, and so, this is what we need to avoid happening. So, going back to the previous one, I can tell you um, from uh, the couple, the the, uh, we had an extreme family where uh, a, carrier's, uh, a carrier uh, for a 4121 translocation was missed, and that family had five children with uh, Down syndrome. Uh, so you can imagine the cost to the family as well as the cost to the entire uh, health services. So you need to avoid them. Right? Um, so in this particular instance, uh, this uh, uh, lady cannot have a normal child always have a child with Down syndrome and therefore we have to take them uh, to the alternative options that they have. So in this case it would be um, IVF with donor uh, ova and the husband's sperm um, or adoption. So those are the two options that they will have. 15 year old girl with delayed puberty, short stature. So um, Interestingly, um, uh, so here is um, the, from the girls, um, what we generally find uh, a lot of girls with, uh, you know, Turner syndrome. And um, it, it may be that you don't pick them up, uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, when they are little children, but uh, you pick them up later also. So uh, we, I think, uh, pick more up when they are, in their teenage years because of, uh, you know, uh, primary amenorrhea. And of course, um, uh, some of them also uh, because of some fertility later on uh, after marriage, uh, even if they have um, had a little bit of um, menstruation for some reason. Um, and uh, uh, so here is a girl in this particular instance um, with mosaic 
uh, Turner syndrome. So you can see there's only one X chromosome here. Um, yeah, so in this particular instance, um, of course, uh, uh, nowadays, because uh, uh, the endocrinology services have developed, um, uh, they are getting a very good deal, I should say. The endocrinologists are providing fantastic service for them. Um, this was kind of not the case 20 years ago uh, because the speciality was developing. But um, And then, of course, uh, the issue, the long-term issue, of course, would be uh, uh, subfertility. Um, and um, so... Be, um, Beyond that, um, the other um, medical issues um, could be dealt with um, by the endocrinologists. Here's another one, 18 year old girl with delayed puberty. Um, so um, what is the condition? Here you can see uh, 46XY, um, normal uh, male, um, Karyotype complement, uh, chromosome complement here, and um, so you can of course do this, uh, you know, detection of the SRY gene also. Um, and when you do that, um, uh, you find that that is also positive. So here is anyway, you don't have to do both. Basically, it's just for illustration purposes here. Uh, we would do just the karyotype, and with that karyotype, you can uh, see that this person. Um, is having delayed puberty or primary amenorrhea because of uh, because uh, uh, she is having androgen insensitivity syndrome, and of course to confirm the diagnosis um, uh, for a clinical diagnosis this is enough. But you might want to do the mutation testing of the uh, SR um, uh, the androgen receptor gene. That's where the mutation is, and um, so. Um, it is possible. So currently, um, you know, most parts of the world, although in some of the presentations you were shown websites where you can find single gene testing uh, laboratories and uh, gene panel testing laboratories and so, so on, the current trend now is just to do the exome because the cost of doing that is uh, the same as doing some of these single gene tests. Uh, so with the exome test, you can do an uh, so currently, um, for anyone who can afford it, it's available in the country and in the faculty in the Human Genetics Unit. Uh, it's offered uh, at a cost of 95,000 rupees. And uh, uh, prior to the COVID situation, of course, uh, the Ministry of Health um, had issued a circular for patients uh, for genetic tests to be paid. And as a result of that, uh, some patients were getting these exome tests uh, done uh, through the uh, you know national health uh, um, budget of the country as it were um, free of cost uh, to them and we had done a fair number of patients uh, exome sequencing uh, based uh, paid by the ministry of health and this will become a regular test in the future so really you don't need to go looking for tests um, you know uh, laboratories abroad you can of course get sequencing for any condition done uh, now through the human genetics unit Here is uh, um, here are some dysmorphic features, and you can um, send the answer to what this condition is uh, via the chat, and maybe um, I will let the chairperson announce the winner <laughs> at the end of the <laughs> as the last item in the in the um, in the uh, session today. Moving on to some. Monogenic uh, disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a little problem here reading this. Uh, it's covered by the a 23-year-old uh, female from a family affected with spinal cerebellar ataxia request pre-symptomatic genetic testing. Discuss your approach to determining the underlying genetic etiology of this condition in the family. Um, Following genetic testing, she was found to have a pathogenic variant. Uh, discuss what information you would provide her regarding the risk of developing spinal cerebellar ataxia. So, um, 
you can see that uh, these families um, uh, generally what we would do is now here is a healthy person in any condition in adult and, uh, onset condition what we would do is we would ask the um, uh, if there is a person affected with the condition in the family present we will first test that person um, so in this girl also we would have done that and uh, when we test uh, the affected person and find a mutation then we know definitely that that is the one which is causing the condition in the family so for any inherited condition that is what we would do um, generally if there is an affected person we'll test the affected person first and identify the mutation. It can be cardiac disorders, it can be neuro disorders, it can be um, uh, cancers, anything. We'll try to do that. Um, and then uh, once you identify the genetic mutation, we would test that per, uh, the other asymptomatic people in the family for all, um, uh, for those mutations, uh, for that mutation, right? So for that specific mutation. So. Uh, in this case, we would have done that, and then um, so let's say detected the in the father, and then tested the father and found the mutation, and then we would have um, said, okay, now because we know what's causing it in your family, we can test you, although you don't have the fem uh, the uh, manifestations of the condition, and generally we wait till after 18 years of age. Um, we will not, uh, you know try to um, uh, test, we would not test, uh, you know, a person who has not, uh, he's not, uh, who's below the age of consent, as it were, um, even if the parents insist on it, uh, because um, we have to, you know, give the option for the child to know or not to know. So if this person came, uh, this child, uh, this girl was brought to us when she was 15 years old by the parents, we would generally not do it. Um, but um, there are exceptional situations we might do it, but generally we will not. And if the parents uh, agree, we'll delay that uh, so that the child can take a decision of his own, his or her own after the eighteen after eighteen years. Now, um, once we uh, find a mutation like this, obviously, then um, uh, you know, uh, before we uh, offer the test it's very important to give real good counseling to the patient um, pre-symptomatic person who wants the uh, testing done as well as to the other family members to make sure that they are doing the correct thing you don't want to psychologically harm a person who is otherwise coping with life and so on so once you establish that this person is really just want to know and can handle that information if it doesn't uh, you know uh, come properly uh, I mean, if it, what do you mean by, doesn't, I mean, you, you get a, muta a mutation uh, positive report, that's what I meant. Um, uh, so um, then uh, in that case, uh, you've got to prepare and do the test because uh, we have had families where, you know, let's say a parent has a genetic mutation for whatever condition. And then um, children come and uh, one child says, I want to know, you know, other one says, I don't want to know. Um, and uh, so these, um, and, uh, and therefore, we need to capture those uh, into, and then of course, give them the, um, you know, uh, um, uh, the risk. And of course, in this kind of situation, spinal cerebral ataxia, uh, and most of the neurodegenerative disorders, you saw some of the work, um, you know, testing uh, large numbers of patients we've tested um, at uh, the Human Genetics Unit, the papers uh, Dulika showed you. Um, what we find is that uh, um, because these conditions are caused by what we call triplet repeat expansions in the genome, which get the size of that triplet repeat expansion increases from generation to generation. And as a result of that, what happens is that the disorder becomes more severe and comes on at an earlier age. That is what you call anticipation. There was, uh, um, uh, so it can happen 
through maternal inheritance or paternal inheritance, both sides, right? So the phenomena of anticipation is when a condition becomes severe uh, from generation to generation and occurs earlier in life. So in this kind of situation, especially the spinal cerebellar ataxia, you will find that uh, uh, the children will get the condition before um, at a younger age than the parents. So you need to quietly, you know, um, uh, quietly prepare them for that and give them the proper advice and guidance. And so, you know, things like cho choice of uh, job, which field should you be going to and so on, you can quietly di direct them properly so that um, they, are, and they will uh, be properly, you know, uh, they will be productive uh, for a long period of time. Otherwise, if they are in the wrong job or so on, they will immediately become, you know, non-productive and uh, uh, will be a, become a burden to the family as a society as well. So those are some of the things that you might need to consider in this. Then um, another one. Yeah, so this is a similar one. Um, again, um, uh, you know, uh, I'll skip that. So, so you, so here is a family. Uh, is someone with a family history of breast cancer. Wants to know whether it's genetically predisposed. Discuss your approach to determining the underlying genetic etiology of this condition in this family. Um, so. I'll follow what um, I told you earlier, that is we will try to identify a person who is uh, um, affected with cancer. And uh, in this particular instance, I think we would have uh, tested the mother or uh, the mother. Um, and uh, we find a BRCA2 mutation in the mother. And now with this mutation, we, will, we can now go and test anybody. So, um, uh, there is a cost implication in this whole thing, right? So now today what we do is we don't test one gene at a time because if you just test BRCA1 gene, it will cost more than 100,000 rupees. BRCA2 gene, another 100,000 rupees. Um, you know, then you go to uh, P53 or something, you get another 100,000 rupees. So you can't go like that. So we just go and do all the genes in one go. So in the mother, we would have tested all the genes. And that, as where I told you, cost is 95,000 rupees um, paid for in the human genetics unit. And what happens with that is wherever the gene that mute, this mutation in, is in, we would identify it. So um, immediately we get a diagnosis. And once we have that, the second person in the family just have to be tested for this mutation only. So therefore, it's not that very expensive. It's about in seven to 10,000. Uh, so you can just test the person and then give the uh, results. So that's what we do. And uh, so um, uh, so um, I will not test the guidelines. Nirmala in her talk uh, gave the link to NCCI um, uh, website. So you can follow the guidelines on what to be done. So we would uh, our job generally would stop at the point of, um, you know, uh, making the diagnosis and counseling and, you know, uh, directing them to get the other family members also tested and so on. And then, of course, if you are asymptomatic, then discussing with them of the lifestyle changes that they may want to make to make sure that they are uh, you know, uh, the, the, the lifestyle changes they may want to make to make sure that uh, they remain asymptomatic for a long, longer period of time. And then, of course, the screening, what screening should they have to detect development of cancer early and so on. So those are the things that we do. Yeah, so here is a prenatal case. Um, uh, so um, the kind of um, abnormality you would detect. So here is a um, child with uh, multiple fractures detected, uh, you know, in a fetal life, um, suggesting of osteogenesis in imperfecta. And uh, so there, there'll be lots of, you know, cases like this, where we come across uh, the different um, issues. And um, um, so depending on the case, uh, you would give the prognosis and discuss and so on. Right, and um, so 
in this day and age when people want to know uh, want to have healthy children uh, you know can afford even uh, pgd with ivf uh, it is always important when you have an abnormal baby uh, to tell them with the future in mind that uh, once this baby is delivered whatever the way um, um, uh, to you know direct them to get a sample of the baby and to get a genetic diagnosis done is so very important uh, because then you can uh, think about what you are going to do in the next pregnancy and offer them uh, the appropriate diagnosis okay in this case osteogenesis is imperfect you wouldn't want uh, would you wouldn't even need a genetic diagnosis uh, to detect prenatally but if you are basically going for uh, pgd then you would need the genetic diagnosis here's a long case i don't have the pedigree here huh? yeah <laughs> This was going to be an exercise for all of you to draw a pedigree, so we'll skip that uh, in the interest of time. So drawing a pedigree, looking at a story and listening to a story and drawing a pedigree is so very important now and everyone, um, all doctors should be able to use, um, uh, you know, the pedigree drawing symbols and uh, draw a pedigree. So, uh, um, so you know, one way to do that, uh, start getting to draw pedigrees would be drawing the pedigree of your own family. You can always do that as an exercise. So um, those were the cases that uh, we wanted to uh, discuss with you today. Um, so um, I hope, um, you know, throughout the morning and going into a little bit in the afternoon now, um, I've seen uh, the numbers of people in the workshop have remained the same. <laughs> so that probably is an indication of all of your interest um, uh, in the subject of genetics. And as we go on in the future, genetics and genomics will be, um, you know, a mainstay in uh, clinical um, medicine. And uh, developing an interest and, uh, and um, uh, you know, developing an interest and uh, uh, getting into the field is something, uh, you know, very, very uh, important. Um, and uh, therefore, um, uh, you should always, uh, um, you know, uh, be encouraged to do that. And uh, we would always encourage you to do that. And uh, so take the step in getting into genetics. We'll be happy to answer some questions because it has been always, uh, I mean, this today has, uh, other than for the chat, uh, which came alive a little while ago, it has been a one-way journey uh, entire morning. Um, so if any one of you want to, um, um, you know, uh, ask any questions, uh, we'd be happy to, you know, take a little Q&A for about uh, 10, 15 minutes. You can raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, from here, I think. Uh, excuse me, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, kind of opportunity to raise a question. Raise your hands, then we'll unmute you. Uh, Satushara here. Is anyone speaking? Excuse me, sir. Satushara here. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to giving us uh, raise a question, sir. Uh, <laughs> Regarding the pharmacogenomics, uh, the responses to the uh, specified drug, uh, it has been mapped in the uh, genetic materials, whatever the patient is uh, uh, bearing at the moment. Uh, have you seen any kind of epigenetic changes which we can detect uh, in the, our uh, genetic analysis, which have been acquired or something like that? What is the, uh, the, the prevalence or the, uh, your findings regarding the uh, pharmacogenomics in the, uh, with the view of epigenetic changes? Right. Um, I mean, um, well, basically, um, we haven't really done any research uh, to look at. And uh, um, uh, so other than adopting um, some of the work that's happening internationally in the field of pharmacogenomics, uh, We've um, really not uh, moved into doing um, work um, in uh, 
um, uh, you know, looking at epigenetics of um, uh, response to drugs in our population, uh, Nirmala. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I think um, drug response, um, um, there isn't much epigenetic work um, that I'm really? aware of. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also not aware of even internationally, Tushara. I'm sorry. Yeah. Prof, there's yeah. another question on the chat uh, directed to you, sir. It says, uh, thank you, sir, for the very informative lecture on pharmacogenomics. Uh, this is from Dr. PGP Daniel. Uh, how can we link, link pharmacogenomics and patient safety? That's the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, um, uh, you know, uh, well, you, we've got to start using pharmacogenomics uh, in, uh, uh, in drug prescribing. No way out of it. Um, and uh, unless uh, we do that, we would be, uh, you know, dosing our patients um, inappropriately. Um, so um, we need to um, start incorporating these into our guidelines and start uh, using them and uh, it is actually easier said than done even in the western countries it's not happening um, uh, routinely even in the UK it's not happening routinely it's only now that some of the like you know uh, talking about warfarin now it's um, uh, one, uh, it's only now that um, in uh, some of the uh, you know coagulation clinics in places like the UK that they have started using genetic uh, testing um, in their uh, clinic uh, in their clinics to uh, decide uh, dosing, but um, so the bottom line is the National Health Service has to take um, leadership in incorporating uh, these um, guidelines into their clinical practice. And um, although at different times we have tried to introduce them. Uh, here, the take up is uh, not so great, um, and uh, partly because um, in the past um, the patients had to pay for it. Uh, but uh, now, I think, with the ministry um, at least saying the tests that are done through the human genetics unit, they will pay, uh, we, uh, we would be able to you know, look at how we can work with the Ministry of Health to introduce some of these tests into um, uh, routine practice. Okay, so there's another question from Dr. Mohammed Navraz. He's a GP and he says, as a GP, can we directly refer the suspected cases for genetic testing? Oh, yes. Um, uh, the, um, you know, the majority of patients uh, with genetic conditions are with the general practitioners and out there. Uh, so um, uh, we get uh, many referrals from general practitioners. Mm -hmm. So as you can um, also see, like uh, one of the problems that uh, patients have is that uh, they really don't, um, um, you know, everybody has to come to Colombo at some point in time. So that's why we started our master's courses and so on. And as a result of that, now we have services, uh, you know, developing in um, all parts of the country. And uh, so um, depending on wherever you are. So you can, uh, you have an array of people who you can now refer patients to. Um, so um, they don't have to come to Colombo itself. And because we are all working as a group um, and uh, we should, we'll definitely be able to help your patients. Are there any more questions? Anyone? Um, so I can't see any other questions on the chat box. If you have a question, you can please unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it on the chat box. Okay, there's another question from Dr. R.D. Vijay Singh. Um, says, uh, what are the testing available in Sri Lanka for gynecological cancer patients? He's an SR in gynecological oncology. Um, well, basically, um, as uh, we were saying, the facilities are there to do any test. Um, so, if, um, for example, you are looking at uh, inherited pre 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 predisposition to cancer, uh, breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, uh, and looking at BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations, and so on. Um, and th so those uh, tests are available. Um, and then um, if you want to do any particular genetic test on uh, uh, on uh, ovarian uh, tumor tissue, uh, 
um, then if you were to talk with us, we can set that test up. You know, I don't know if there are any specific tests for ovarian cancer, Nirmala. Um, uh, so um, uh, because uh, uh, things like KRAS testing, um, EGFR testing, um, um, BRAF testing, and so on for uh, colorectal cancers, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, lung cancers, um, uh, and so on, those were all set up because the oncologists wanted uh, us to set up those tests. Uh, so similarly, um, if there is a particular test that, is, uh, that you require, uh, we'll be happy to uh, set it up um, for you um, because uh, you know, the facilities to set, do any test is available in the country. Um, if a particular test is not there, that's because there's no demand for it. And uh, so um, if, uh, if you reach out to us, we'll be happy to um, you know, set up uh, any test particularly targeting the tumor tissues for you. So Dr. Daniel is asking about uh, Eastern, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I was just going to say, uh, if there's anybody uh, uh, in the Eastern University interested uh, in, uh, uh, Daniel, I know where you are. So <laughs> uh, you can encourage uh, someone, um, uh, to anybody to you know, um, uh, join our master's courses uh, and uh, get trained and go back. And even uh, uh, we do train PhDs. Uh, you saw Dr. Um, S.S. Kolambage from Sabaragamu who's uh, uh, reading for his PhD with us talking this morning. Um, so um, everybody who was uh, you know, talking from uh, Jaffna to um, Gaul were all alumni of the uh, Human Genetics Unit and we'll be happy to take them on board and train. And of course, I must um, uh, tell you all that uh, now uh, clinical genetics is available as a subspeciality through the PGIM. So, um, um, so th through the PGIM, if you do pediatrics, uh, uh, after you get your MD pediatrics uh, as a subspeciality, you can uh, train in uh, clinical genetics. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, Two of the people in this, um, um, you know, today in, in the audience, uh, Dr. Tushara Apiwansa and um, uh, Dr. Vindya Subhasingha, they are the first uh, clinical genetics uh, trainees um, in the um, program. And hopefully next time when we have a symposium like this, uh, they will also be talking to you. Uh, and uh, every year, in addition to pediatrics, uh, we take in two more from uh, the adult uh, medicine also. So you can do pediatrics uh, and uh, subspecialize in uh, clinical genetics and become a board certified consultant geneticist. Um, or you can do adult medicine and then subspecialize in, uh, uh, again, clinical genetics uh, with a focus on adults and uh, uh, become, um, uh, uh, you know, and also become, um, uh, 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 you know, clinical geneticist uh, focusing on the uh, adults. Uh, so. Every year now uh, we take in uh, two from the main uh, from every every batch. So basically, going forward, uh, like we believe that every year there'll be eight trainees entering the program, and uh, so with that um, we will have uh, at least um, in the next um, you know it's a three-year yeah. program. So um, it, it will take three to four years for a, a genetics to come out. So, but I think starting 2023. Um, we should be having uh, clinical board certified clinical geneticists working in the Ministry of Health System and then, uh, you know, working in the entire country. Um, um, hopefully, the master plan is that uh, 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 the master plan is that uh, there would be a clinical geneticist for every every district of the country uh, by the year I think twenty thirty. Um, so we should. We should have a lot of people on the ground in the future. And of course, uh, for those others who don't want to get into that route, we have a master's in uh, molecular pathology, which we are doing. Uh, and also, um, uh, we have uh, PhD programs, um, especially for those who are in academic programs in universities. Mm -hmm. So we'll be happy to have you all joining us. So okay. um, I think in the absence of uh, any further comments and questions, we will be bringing this uh, workshop to a conclusion soon. 
but uh, I would like to make some announcements before that. So thank you all for participating in today's workshop. It's been quite a long day and sorry for the fact that we couldn't give you a break, uh, but I think uh, everybody enjoyed it and um, I'm sure you'll find this information uh, very uh, useful in your practice and we hope that you will begin to integrate and implement genetics and genomics in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. And if you need to refer patients for further genetic evaluation, you can always refer them to the Human Genetics Unit, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And of course, um, we have our website also, the Human Genetics Society website. So if you go to the web and type uh, humangeneticsociety.lk, we have a lot of information there. We have monthly webinars, uh, newsletters, and so on. So you can participate in these activities also, which I think will be useful for your uh, training in genetics and genomics. So the last announcement I would like to make is regarding the uh, e-certificates. Those will be sent to you after the SLMA sessions. And uh, the PDF of the presentations will be sent to all the registered participants. So by early next week, you should be having the complete set of uh, presentations that we did today. Um, so thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Vajra Desanayak for the excellent talks and, uh, of course, discussing and explaining and you know how you can get involved in the, these trainings. Thank you, sir. And um, I would like to thank all the speakers that took part in today's uh, workshop. Thanks for the time and effort you spent. And um, I'm sure all the participants enjoyed it and we look forward to future workshops and uh, meetings. So thank you very much. And we will conclude the session here. Thank you very much, Madam Sir.